this week on, on news feeds, media, television, radio, all the news, there's still the coronavirus, COVID-19, and this pandemic which is engulfing the world. Whilst we thought for a while it was easing, it's obviously escalating throughout the world, particularly in the Americas where there are record uh, cases of, of coronavirus appearing each day and record deaths. As I said just this week that if, if Florida was its own nation, it would be fourth on the list of coronavirus cases. Very serious across the world. It's, it's wreaking havoc of illness and death and struggle. But it's also identifying and highlighting some of the deficiencies in the systems of, of human beings across the world. Just to, th to highlight three. The economics, the economic systems we use. I mean, obviously there's economic chaos in, in many parts as, as people are isolated and work and unemployment, all of that. But a deeper issue is the dynamics of unjust economics across the world. It's highlighting once again the difference, the disparity between the haves and the have-nots, the poor and the rich. The, more and more, fewer and fewer people are controlling more resources in the world and that the poor of the world continue to have less access to the resources they need. Oxfam this week came out with a report suggesting that if this pandemic continues in the way it is, the most significant issue confronting the world really in terms of death will not be death via virus but by starvation. It's, it's projecting that 12,000, over 12,000 people a day will die of starvation because of the economic inequities that are revealed through this pandemic. To put that into perspective, the highest death rate in one day so far has been back in, I think it was May, and it was just over 8,000. So more will die of starvation than of virus. Throughout this, this pandemic, the poorer countries have access to less resources, health, food and other things. And there's, it's just revealing the inequities of our systems, the failures of our economic systems, to be just, fair and to deliver resources across the world to all people. The, the, the second area is, is the environment, is, is, is the rest of the earth, is planet earth. For some decades now, experts, not only environmentalists, but, but those who are epidemiologists and those who have expertise in zoonotic viruses, which are the viruses that transfer from animals into humans, uh, such as HIV, Ebola, SARS, COVID-19 virus, co uh, SARS-CoV-2. And they've been predicting a pandemic exactly like this for some time. And their information is based not only on the study of viruses, but the study of the environment and the fact that hum humans have been ravishing the, the world ecosystems, habitats of, of creatures across the world so violently in these last few hundred years that humans and these wilder animals that contain these other viruses are coming into much more close contact more frequently. And so the transition and transfer of viruses from, from wilder animals to humans is more commonplace. This is exacerbated by climate change where the world's climate is changing and there is movement, transmigration of, of animals and species into, into different areas to find places where they can live and survive. And that's bringing them into close contact with humans in other ways. And we're not doing anything really to address the environmental crisis we face and the pandemic is revealing and highlighting that. The third area, the World Health Organization came out this week and it highlighted that the major factor in the, the spread of this, this virus and the pandemic and, and the, whether this pandemic becomes worse or better is world leadership. And the head of who, I'll call him Dr. G, I cannot pronounce, I can't pronounce his name properly, says that we're world leaders offer wise, humble, strong leadership, listening to the voices of experts, working together and bringing the wisdom of different people and different expertise together 
there'll be a much more positive outcome. We're world leaders, egocentric, self-centered, ignorant, doing their own thing, blaming others, and not taking a good control, good lead, there's chaos. And we're seeing that really in Brazil and America in particular. The other area that, that um, the World Health Organization highlight is if this is the time, this is the moment, if never before, that humanity needs to come together in a united way. In responses to this pandemic and to the virus, we still have too many individuals and, and corporations doing their own thing, working away feverishly by themselves, seeking their own glory or wealth or power or whatever it is. It's time for the world to come together. That we as a human race need to set aside our differences, to use our diversity in a unified way, to work together to resolve the problems. We'll only resolve the world's problems if we work together. Because that's the pattern that God brings in to human world, human life, to the world. The Trinity is three in one, three diversity in a unity. And that's the pattern within our world. When we work together and value and respect each other and listen to one another and don't let our differences lead us into conflict and division, we will do much better. This, um, this virus is, are they living organisms? Probably not. They're, they're pieces of genetic information, either RNA or DNA. DNA, the genetic code in all our cells. RNA, the, the kind of the template for the genetic code, if you like, in all our cells. Coded by a protein and often with a, a lipid membrane around them, a fatty membrane around them to protect them. And they're, they're very, they're minute particles, virions, minute particles you can't see even with a light microscope. And they have things on the coronavirus has got these extensions like cactus, looking like cactus, and they join onto cells, ordinary cells, and they fuse and they become part of the cell. They release their genetic code into the cell and take over the, the cell's machinery which replicates the genetic information and produces new proteins and those proteins are about the virus and so it replicates itself many 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 fold in, in every cell and reforms these little virions, these little virus particles within the cell and then they released, explode out of the cell into the human body and affect other cells and the, and, and the process replicates and it just goes, from, goes on and, and, and that's how the infection spreads throughout our body and then when we breathe out or, or cough or sneeze or whatever, the droplets contain these, these virions or cells with the virions in them and they transmit. This week, it, it, with that in the background, I come back to Jesus' stories. He talks about, he tells three stories. There's a farmer. A farmer goes and sends his, his, his servants, his, his um, labourers out to sow the field with wheat. They do so. Sometime later they come back and they're excited and they say, Master, Master, someone has sown your field, sown weeds into your field. Should we go out and, and, and dig them up? And the Master says, that's the enemy has come through the night and sown weeds amongst my wheat. Don't, don't go and rip them out because you may pull the weed out alongside the weeds. The, the, the type of weed that's referred to here is, is one that looks very much like wheat when it's very young. The immature plants look very similar, hard to tell apart. It's only when they grow and the wheat produces its fruit, its grain if you like, that the wheat is, dis is distinguished from the weeds because the wheat has a heavy grain head which bends over when it's mature. The weed doesn't. It's empty. It's, it's, a, it's an airhead. It has nothing in it and it floats up in the breeze and stands high. There's nothing to, to force it to bend over. So it's easy when the mature plants are, exist code by, side by side, you can pick the weed from the wheat come and pull the weed out, that becomes chaff for fuel and the wheat becomes the harvest. And so that's what the, the gardener, the, the, the master says, just wait till the harvest. 
we'll know which is which. The implication, there's many implications, but one of them is within each of us are weeds and wheat, good and evil. We each, we each have within us that which is good and lovely and that which isn't. There's stuff in us which is loving and kind and patient and gentle, which is open to others and inclusive and, and generous and just and fair and all of that. There's also stuff in all of us that's, that's not, that's violent, it's, it's, it's unloving, it's selfish, self-centred, it's about us. Different attitudes or things we do or say. If we just judge ourselves or other people on the bad things we see, we lose sight of what's good in them. And God is saying, what is good and what's bad within people, within the human race, will be told by its fruit. And we shouldn't judge just on what we see as bad. You know, what, what in a person is really good and what can be nurtured and, 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 uh, and lovely? How can we help each other to, to, to push down the evil and the egocentric sort of stuff, the violence, and nurture that which is good, the wheat over the weeds? He goes on, he says, the kingdom of, of heaven is also, or the kingdom of God, the reign of God, is also like a mustard seed. One of the smaller seeds, insignificant little seed. But when it's planted, it becomes this mustard bush and it takes over a wild weed. It takes over the countryside or the farms or wherever and becomes a pest. He goes on, in one little verse, he tells this other, the reign of God is like a woman who takes some yeast and puts it into three measures of flour and mixes it. So the whole lot is influenced, is affected. You know, I, I, um, I remember hearing those stories and, and, you know, the kingdom of God or the reign of God is like a mustard seed, small, but when it grows, it becomes big and wondrous. Isn't that great? Or like a woman making bread. The yeast, a little bit of yeast, has this great impact and makes this loaf of bread. And isn't that wonderful? It's influence. And yes, there is that element that, that yes, we can influence the world in little ways. Little bits of, of love go a long way. But these are subversive parables. And the people of, the, of Jesus' time would understand them much better than we do. He might have said, the reign of God is like... COVID-19, a virus which, which upsets the world order. Not so much the death and, and stuff, but, but upsets the world order, highlighting the, the inequities of economic systems, the abuse of humans on the environment which have actually allowed this virus to take place, take root and, 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 and happen. Um, the, the, inequity, the poor leadership and the, and the conflicts and divisions that, that divide us and stop us from working together. What Jesus is saying with these parables is this, this yeast, this yeast in the, in, the, in the flour, it's three measures of flour. Now, I didn't realise three measures of flour is about 23 kilograms of flour. This is probably the store of flour for the family, for the household. And this woman, maybe a servant probably in the household, actually subverts the whole household's order by mixing yeast in. And once you've put yeast into the flour and fermentation is allowed to begin, the whole lot's ruined. Because fermentation begins a process of rotting, if you like. Whilst it, it, it's good to eat for a while, it will go off. The flour can be stored for a long time. When it has yeast in it, it must be used up pretty quickly. This woman is subverting the household. And what Jesus is really on about in these parables, the, the mustard seed that takes over the, 
the area, the, the region, the, the weed. It's a weed, it's a yeast, it's a leaven in the economic, in the political system of Rome. Leaven wasn't a positive image in the Bible. Leaven is, you know, the le we wear of the leaven of the Pharisees, says Jesus, their arrogance and hypocrisy. and They know what they're saying, but they don't do it. There's the feast of unleavened bread, not leavened bread. And Jesus is using this, this image, this negative image, to say, we can corrupt the corruption of the world. The, in fact, the words that he uses in there uh, for the, the, the leaven mixing into the dough is crypt and encrypt in, in two different um, translations of Mark and Matthew. Crypt or encrypt. The word we get encryption from with using computers, it's about hiding the message, hiding this thing, this message, you, you encrypt a, a page or a, a document, an email, so that people can't read it, can't see it. She's hiding the yeast in the flour and it will go off. It's about the reign of God subverting and corrupting the corruption of the world. Too much of, of our churches are, are not corruptors of a corrupt system but we get alongside the system and we work with it and we benefit from it, even though it's unjust. Jesus' life and ministry was about working amongst the poor and the marginalised and the ordinary people who suffered under the violence of Rome and the violence of their own leaders, whose economic injustice held them ransom, not ransom, but you know, held them in a, in a way that was harsh and difficult, high taxations and poverty, struggle. And he said, that's not right. The systems that excluded those who were sick or disabled or whose lives didn't measure up in some way and were pushed to the margins of society. The exclusive systems that, that, that push people out rather than bring them together. The reign of God which holds all people and says, look, everyone has good and evil in us. Let's not judge everyone just because of the, the things we see that we don't like or, or are bad or are different. But let's look at the lovely things in a person too and nurture and encourage that. It's only as we all work together and come together that the reign of God can be experienced and known within us. That God's love and grace can flourish and blossom. And then the yeast might actually become the bread of life that gives life to the world. There are systems in our world that are unjust, that are unfair, that are breaking people. And Jesus invites us to have the courage to stand up to these systems, to be a corrupting influence for justice, for love, for hope and for peace. And that's going to take some courage. It's going to take us working together. It's going to take us willing to change. to stand alongside those who are really hurting in our world. And it's not going to be popular. But it will bring life to our world. And what choice do we really have? Amen. <laughs>
Mmm. -hmm.